Our scripture lesson today comes from Luke chapter 13. And I'll be reading verses 10 through 17. Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. <coughs> Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, Indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day. When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I attended a small private liberal arts college for my undergraduate education. And in the classical liberal arts tradition, I was required to take a broad range of courses across several disciplines, including the sciences, the humanities, and the arts. For my arts requirement, I was glad to take courses in art history and music, and even a new course on the history of American film. Before completely fulfilling my arts requirements, however, I realized that I had selected all of the course offerings that met my interests. There was only one course offering in the category of the arts that I could take before graduating. And much to my chagrin, it was a course on dance. I'll let some of you figure that one out. My roommate was in the same predicament as I was, so we agreed to suffer through the course together. The thinking was that we, the only two males in the course, would share the humiliation. In retrospect, I actually liked the reading for the course, as the reading introduced me to some of the great dancers like Alvin Ailey and Martha Graham and Hanya Ohm, who helped to shape modern dance expression. After discussing the readings for each class, we had to engage in the practice of dance. Now this was the part of the course that I disliked. The course finally ended with the requirement for each student to choreograph and perform his or her own dance routines. And somehow, by the grace of God, I made it through the course. I choreographed and performed my own routine. <laughs> no one laughed at me. At least no one laughed aloud, as I recall. One of the positive outcomes of my having taken the college dance course was to gain a profound appreciation for the hard work and discipline, the skill and the grace that make for professional dancers. In our gospel lesson, we encounter a dancer who to our knowledge had no professional training. In fact, the scripture says that she had been in a crippled condition for 18 long years, and yet she rendered a praise to God in joyful gratitude for what God had done for delivering her from her infirmity. There are three important elements to this woman's praise dance routine which I believe are instructive for us today. First, she chose the right partner. Second, she marked her place. And third, the woman gave it all she had. Let us begin with choosing the right partner. If you have ever performed a dance routine before, especially one in which you were judged, you know how important it is to choose the right partner. A good partner can aid you through the dance routine, even make you a better performer. A bad partner, on the other hand, can destroy the performance. Back in the day when 
you went to a dance, you chose your partner based on a list of criteria. Guys, for example, would routine, routinely choose girls who were uh, pretty and popular. In the spiritual realm, however, we choose the partner who will guarantee that we will dance with the heavenly hosts. And my friends, there's only one partner who can permit us to dance on those streets of gold. His name is Jesus. And you see, one day the dancing down here will end. The music will cease. And if we want to dance again, we have to be sure that we have chosen not just the right partner, but the righteous one. We have help in choosing Christ. The help that we have is that God has already chosen us. You remember what God said to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. God has already chosen us. We just have to make sure that in this life, we choose him. The woman in our gospel lesson, in all her sickness and strife, chose Christ. She made her way to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And even more, when Jesus called her, she answered. Now, this is, this is one of the first revelations that this woman, we have to imagine in our minds, that this woman had a crippling condition. Maybe it was a really, really bad arthritic condition and there was nothing that could be done for it. And she had been in this position, bent over, for 18 years. Unable to stand up. And yet, this woman, on the, on the Sabbath day, is in the synagogue. I mean, it's such a, don't miss it. Don't miss it because, you know, we, we're very good at making excuses as to why we can't go to church. I've heard it. I've been pastoring a long time. You'd be surprised at the reasons that people give you for not going to church on Sundays. Yes. You know, some, some will tell you, you know, well, I can, watch, I can watch church on TV. Yes. And I'll watch church on TV, too. But there's something that you're not going to get on TV that you're going to get in the church. Yes. In the house of God, in places that have been created for the glory of God, where people meet every week to, to have fellowship and to, to discern where God is leading. There's something that you're not going to get on the internet or on the TV. You, and this woman, 18 years. 18 years. And on a Sabbath day, she's in this, oh man. It's a, it's a powerful testimony. The next time, the next time that you think of a reason not to go to church, I want you to remember this woman who was, I, I want you to remember her. I want you to remember her. Because she, of all people, she could have said, I'm staying home today. I mean, I really, you know, think about, think about beyond the pain that she had. This crippling condition. Beyond the pain, imagine all the public sort of uh, uh, attention that she received, the negative attention that she received in that condition, bent over for 18 years, and yet she finds it a place in her heart to be in God's house on God's day. It's a wonderful testimony. It's a wonderful testimony. The revelation here is that the woman chose the synagogue. And that, and for our purposes, let's say that she chose the church. The scripture says it this way. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled, that had crippled her for 18 years. Now here, here's another revelation. That she, she so, shows up where she's going to be, and Jesus had showed up where he was supposed to be. You see, the thing is, God is going to be in God's house. Uh, do you hear me? God, God, is not going to, God is not going to not be where God is supposed to be on God's day. God's going to be there. The question is, are we going to be there? So if the woman had stayed home, guess who she would have missed on that? She would have missed Jesus. Not just, not, just any, not just any sort of teacher, not just any rabbi. She would have missed Jesus. But she, she, went, she walked the church, bent over. She entered, she entered the synagogue bent over, and it just so happened that Jesus chose that synagogue on that day. Jesus was where Jesus was supposed to be, and the woman who was crippled for 18 years was where she was supposed to be. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up, the scripture says. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, woman, you are set free from 
your element. The thing is, the thing is, when we decide to come to church, I, I believe that, that God does something special for us, and we don't always realize what God does for us. Sometimes God heals us, and we're not even aware that we're healed. Sometimes God lifts the burden, and we're not even sure why we feel better. I mean, it should be a week where we just completely implode, but somehow we're just able to make it through the week. Because God heals us in special ways when we make a point to get to God's house. Do you believe me, church? You are set free from your, in, from your ailment. And when he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. The revelation here is that she had already chosen the church, but choosing church is not enough. Listen to me very carefully. Choosing church is not enough. We have to choose Christ, yes? yes. Yeah. Now see, there's a difference. I found out, I found out something. You know, being in a lot of churches for a lot, you know, all my life, really, but pastoring for almost 20 years, and I found out that not everybody that's choosing church is choosing Christ. Some people, some people choose church, but they, but they reject Christ, who is Lord of the church. And why, why do you think there are such things as mean church people? They haven't chosen. They haven't chosen. I'm not talking about just had a bad day. I'm just talking about persistently mean. <laughs> and, and ornery and cantankerous and, and evil. And, no, they, they choose the church, but they haven't chosen Christ. Who is the Lord. See, the thing is, when we choose Christ, you know, Christ, we give God a chance to deal with all of that stuff and to, and to shape us and to mold us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Choose Christ. Choosing church and choosing Christ are not necessarily one and the same. There's a popular TV show. I'm sure you've watched it. It's called Dancing with the Stars. Have you seen this show? Dancing with the Stars, in, in which professional dancers are paired with ce celebrities in an all-out dance competition. Have you seen this show? You will never see two dancers perform their entire routine across the floor from each other. Have you ever seen that? I mean, one dancer's over there, and another dancer's 30 feet over there, and they're just having, they're just going to town by themselves. You won't, you, won't, you won't see it as antithetical to, to the purpose of, of, of the dance show, yes? That will be awkward indeed. Dance is about how you use space. This is what I learned in my dance class. It's about how you use space. It's about proximity. When I was a youngster, we used to have this dance uh, called, the, uh, some of you may remember this, it was called a slow drag. Now, I'm not, going to do, I'm not going to demonstrate the slow drag because that's not the church on today. But, but let me just tell you that you would, you would choose your partner, and the song had to be nice and slow. Are you with, are you with me, Sister Shannon? He had to be a nice, slow, come here, Sister Vanessa. We can, we can do a sanitized version. We can do a sanitized version of it. We're going to do a nice version. Give her a hand. She's coming up to church. Stop. <laughs> so we're, we're not we're gonna do a nice one, but you let me do it. We just grab here and you just grab me there and we just kind of just dance like this. Now we would be a little closer, but we're in church. <laughs> and we just dance and we rock to the music and we dance. Are y'all following that? And this is this was a this was a really nice dance, but you had to be careful because this dance could get you in trouble, brother Jackson. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> let me go over here to my notes so I don't get in trouble. <laughs> Now, now, let's be clear. Because the dance is performed in very close proximity to your partner, I mean close enough for you to whisper in your partner's ear, sweet nothings. Are y'all with me today, church? Yeah. Now, see, in the spiritual realm, I believe that God desires a close dance. Some of us are dancing with God, but God is way down the street somewhere. Some of us are dancing with God, and God is three miles away, Yes. Some of us are dancing with God, and God is the last encounter that we had with God three years ago, yes? But I believe that God wants to be close to us, yes? I, I believe that God wants to be close enough where God can whisper words of our destiny in our ear. I believe that we have to be close enough to God so God can remind us of the promises that he's given us, yes? I believe that we have to be close enough to God when the world is run amok. God can say to you, listen, I have a purpose and I have a plan for your life. And my plan for your life is not interrupted by all the craziness in this world. But you've got to be close. Yes? That's why when Jesus came to the synagogue and he saw the woman across the room, he told her to come here. What I've got to do for you, you've got to be just 
just a little closer than you are right now. And she made her way over to Jesus. Yes? A dance where, we, where God can whisper a word about our destiny in our ear is the best type of dance. Do you believe it, church? So it was when Jesus saw her and he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment." When he laid his hands on her immediately, the Bible says she stood up straight. And I love what she does next. It says she began praising God. She had been bent over for 18 years. And the first thing that she does when she receives her healing is she praises God. Yes, it's a wonderful testimony. In a similar account recorded in Luke chapter 8, there was a woman who struggled with a malady for 12 years. See, the thing is, the thing is, when you struggle for, for a year or two or three or four or 12 or 18, when God, when God releases you, the only thing that you can do is dance. It is the only thing that you can, that is the appropriate response to a God who is able to deliver you, yes? So when God healed her, she had been, been over for 18 years. When God healed her, she began to, she began to dance right, right away. And so it was with this woman who had an infirmity for 12 long years, yes? Now the thing is, here's the thing. I, I, hope, I hope you get this word today because I think what I, what I believe is that some of us are sick, but we don't know it. And so we're not, we're, not really, we're not really buying into a sermon in which we, we're, we're praising God and we're, we're, we're dancing before God because we really don't know that we have an ailment, yes? These two women knew they were sick. And she, the Bible says that she was sick for 12 years and she, she spent everything that she had. She, there was nothing left. And some of you have gotten to that point where you've exhausted all of your options. There's nothing else for you to do. You've tried to fix your problem. You paid the doctor to try to fix your problem, and you still your problem is worse. Yes, that's where she was. But she she heard that Jesus was passing by, and she said, "Listen, this is my last chance. If I can just get close enough for a dance with God, I'll be okay." She said to herself, "She said, listen, if I can just if I can just muster up the strength and press to the crowd and just touch the hem." All I have to do is touch the hem of his garment, then I'll be made whole. Yes. The word for somebody today is that you've been dancing with God, but God is so far away. And God is asking you, we're in a, we're in a perfect opportunity here as we go into the Lenten season where, where the disciplines of the faith help us to go get, get a close encounter with God. This is a perfect opportunity to say, listen, I've been dancing with God, but God, I need a, I need a close dance. I need a dance that is close enough for you to kind of give me some instructions. I need a dance that is close enough for you to remind me of my destiny. I need a, I need a close dance. This, this thing across the room is now working for me. Are you willing to dance with God in that way? I'm, I'm here to tell you that there, there's some things that only God can fix, yes? And if we make it our business to get close enough to God, where God, where God really sees uh, and discerns uh, uh, the sickness and the health and the things that we're not even aware of that, that, that we're carrying, God will heal us. Yes, a good dancer chooses the right partner. A good dancer marks their place, and a good dancer gives it all that they've got. On giving it all you've got, the Scripture says it this way. Because I believe, I believe, you know, when, when, we, when we have a real life encounter with God, God transforms us so much that we don't worry about what people think about us. We kind of forget that there are people watching us. We remember the 18 years and the 12 years of suffering, so we're not really worried about them. So we're willing to give God all we've got, yes? I like the way John Wesley says it. In the, in the, in the United Methodist hymnal, there's a, there's a preface, and, and Wesley gives us instructions for singing. And he says, he, he tells us essentially, uh, uh, don't be ashamed of your voice any more than when you sang the songs of Satan. <laughs> he said, when you sing these hymns, in other words, when you sing Blessed Assurance, sing it like, like you used to sing that song when you was out there, yes? <laughs> And the scripture, the scripture puts it this way. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Yes. And I believe that God deserves an all your might type of offering. You see, when we were in the world, we can remember giving it all we got. 
God has delivered us, set us free from bondage to sin and death. And sometimes we act like we're ashamed even to say amen. If you believe it, say amen. amen. God delivers us so that we can offer praise to God. God delivers us so that we can express our gratitude to God. God delivers us so that we can be a witness to the world about God's goodness and God's greatness toward us. God delivers us to dance. And sometimes, my friends, I'm almost done, and sometimes our deliverance comes from a dance. This is, this is really good. This is, I'm going to use this one this week for me. This one's for me. That, that sometimes, sometimes the deliverance that we're seeking comes from the dance. Now, now listen to me. Here's the logic. Here's the logic. Sometimes, sometimes the, the, what, what, what we need, God is waiting for us to dance. Now, it doesn't make sense. I know. Because the music is not playing. Because, because we're still caught in a cycle of, of, of depression, or we're, we're still caught in a financial quagmire, or we're, we're still caught in, in self-loathing, and it doesn't make sense for us to dance. We're in that, in that condition. We're waiting for God to touch us and to free us so that we can offer to God the dance. But I believe, I believe that God is saying, no, I want you to dance first. Your deliverance will be birthed out of your dance. Your freedom will eventually from your willingness to offer praise to me, even though I haven't released you yet. Yes? You know why? Because it's a sign of our faith. It doesn't make sense for us to dance and we're still in the same condition. Logically, it doesn't make sense. But by faith, it makes sense. Yes? Faith, the Bible says, is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that we have not seen and cannot see. Do you get it? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Yes? And so sometimes I believe that God is expecting you to dance even though, even though literally you cannot see your deliverance. He's expecting you to offer praise even though you're still in the same situation. He's expecting you to, to show gratitude even though the same thing that you dealt with in 2018 is still following the truth. He's asked, and he said, God is saying to you that you will, be, you will be released because of your willingness to praise me despite what's going on all around you. I'm not just making this up. This is in the Bible. There's a wonderful story in the Bible about a man named Paul and a man named Silas. Do you know the story? And Paul and Silas were, were two devoted disciples of Jesus Christ, and they were ministering. And, and it happened that this, this slave girl was following Paul and Silas on one of their missionary journeys, and she followed them for three days. And she kept saying things to them, and she, kept, she just kept on saying things and saying things to them for three whole days until finally Paul said, look, I, I've had enough of this. I can't take another, I can't take another statement from this lady. This is just driving me insane. And he turned around, and he actually, he healed her from the spirit. Yes, do you know the story? Now, as the story develops, the, the man who owned the slave was very disappointed because at this point, she could, he could no longer gain a profit from her. She was a diviner, yes? She could tell the future. And so, so, so his hope of profit was lost. So, so he had Paul and Silas dragged into, uh, before a court, and he had them beaten, and he had them thrown, not just into any prison, he had them thrown into the inner prison. There was no hope of escape. They were bound in shackles, and they were beaten and thrown into the inner jail, yes? But the Bible says, around midnight. Now, this doesn't make sense, but at, at, at midnight, Paul and, and Silas begin to, to praise God. That doesn't make sense. You're in the inner jail now. What are you talking about? You can literally be killed in this situation. But they began to praise God. Now, now they weren't waiting for God to deliver them so that they could dance. They started dancing in jail. <laughs> they started dancing in the prison and singing in the prison. And all of a sudden, the Bible says there was an earthquake and and, and the, the doors to the prison were, were, were loosened, and, and Paul and Silas went free. Listen, they were, they were free because they decided to dance. And I believe for somebody today, God is waiting on you to express your faith even in hardship. Don't wait for God. Don't wait for God to do it to say thanks and, and do a nice little dance. It's easy to dance when God does something for us. But dance before God does it. Now, if you can dance before God does it, you know what? That is, that is the ultimate sign of your faith. 
that you know, God, this, I'm going to dance like I'm a crazy man because I know that you're able to deliver. Now, you know what? When you do that, you know what you do? You get God's attention. You know what? God, God begins to move. The earthquake is symptomatic of the ways in which God orchestrates in your things in your life to free you. It's not about an earthquake. It's about God shifting things around in your favor. The person that said no is now saying yes. The promotion that they gave to someone else, now they're offering it to you. God shift things around in such a way that you walk into your destiny because you're willing to dance before you get delivered. Yes, are you with me today? Oh, my, my, my. I'm going to dance this week, Sister Vanessa. Listen, if you look, if you see me dancing in the kitchen, it's okay. Don't, don't call the doctor. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm going to dance my way out of this thing. You hear me, church? I'm just going to dance and dance and dance and dance. And the expectation is that God is going to show up. You see, the thing that moves God, I'm finished. The thing that moves God, you know what, you know what moves God? It's our faith. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, we can't even, every person of note in the Bible uh, uh, that we talk about in, in a wonderful way, demonstrated their faith. Yes, it's, it's true with Moses, it's true with Abraham, it's true with Elizabeth, it's true with Mary. Every person in the Bible without faith is impossible to please God. And I believe for somebody today, God wants you to exercise your faith. You're waiting for God to do it so that you can say thank you. God's saying, no, exercise your faith now. I can do it, but exercise your faith now. I'm able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you ask for a thing according to the power that works in you. And see, we're waiting on God. See, God is not Santa Claus. You know, when we're, ch when we're children, you know, the expectation is that, you know, Santa's just going to come down the chimney. Even if we were bad, he's going to come down the chimney and give us a whole truckload of gifts. Yes. But God, but God doesn't, God, God is waiting. When we grow up, God is waiting for us. Yes. God is waiting for us to demonstrate that the fact that we believe in God. And God is saying, listen, I don't know who I'm talking to. This is my last time I'm going to say it. Then we're going to the table. God is waiting on your dance. And God is waiting for you to dance to, close enough to God where God, where, 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 where God can tell you, can remind you of what God told you years ago. But God can remind you of your purpose and, and your destiny. And my, my, my friends, it, it is a promise. In God's time, God will deliver you. Yes? God will deliver you. Thanks be to God. Amen.